arrows dropping like rain. Heroes mowing through hordes of soldiers who frankly aren't getting paid enough to take part in this nonsense. These are all staples of the fantasy genre. So of course, at one point or another, you're going to want to run a mass combat scene in your D&D campaign. Let's talk about how. We don't have a sponsor this month, so special thanks to the YouTube members for keeping the lights on and giving me an excuse to make more of these videos. Being a YouTube member means you get my videos two days earlier and you gain access to a private channel on my Discord server. But let's get started with the video. In D&D, there's usually two ways people will recommend you run mass combat. The first is by using books like Kingdoms and Warfare or Kingmaker. But those books aren't just about how to run a mass combat scene. They're about how to run an entire campaign where the players are building a kingdom or doing a warfare. So if that is the premise of your campaign, cool, go check them out. But if it isn't and you're only running mass combat once in an entire two year long D&D campaign, then picking up a massive 300 page book and teaching your players what is essentially an entirely new system just for that one session, it can be a bit overkill. Which is why the second way people usually recommend running mass combat is don't run mass combat. Instead of wasting your time rolling a bunch of dice to figure out the fates of a bunch of faceless, nameless soldiers who ultimately don't matter, you just focus on what the player characters are doing. You give them a bunch of special objectives like sneaking past enemy lines so they can destroy the enemy's catapult or defeat the enemy's commander. The battle is still happening, but it's in the background. It has no game mechanics. That is honestly a good way to run mass combat. The rules of the game are already designed to handle that type of skirmish gameplay. You don't need any fancy supplements, you can just run it as your usual session of D&D. But on a certain level, whenever I do end up running mass combat, personally, I kind of want it to stand out. This is something that only happens once or twice per campaign. It's even less frequent than a boss fight. So as far as I'm concerned, mass combat gets to be special. Usually, the reason I decide to add a siege to a D&D campaign in the first place is, specifically, to add a bit of variety and make sure we don't fall into too much of a routine. So running that scene the exact same way you're running every other scene, it's something that works, for sure. But it's not necessarily something that creates the experience I'm looking for. It feels a bit to me like giving people a Spelljammer book that tells people to just skip past the Spelljammer combat. It's only good advice because we don't really have a system that actually manages to make that type of gameplay fun. So this video is going to be my attempt at creating such a system. A system you can easily plug into an existing D&D campaign, even if it's just for one session, but that will stand out from the rest of the campaign, hopefully in a good way. You tell me in the comments if you think I've been successful. Here's how I propose we do that. We're going to start by giving each battalion a stat block that works a bit like D&D's swarm type enemies, and then run a regular combat encounter, using all of the rules our players are already familiar with. This won't be enough to make this a good fit for D&D just yet. Trust me, we are going to get to that in just a second. But using all of this existing material as a starting point will make it so much easier to teach our players how to play in this mass combat encounter. Your players already know almost everything there is to know. They'll have access to all of their characters' usual abilities, the ones they've been using for the rest of the campaign. A barbarian player will immediately understand, okay, my role is to charge forward, rage and attack. I know how to do that. A wizard player will find ways to use their spells to manipulate the battlefield and give their allies the upper hand, which is good because that's exactly what they signed up to do when they decided to play a wizard. Each army is divided into commanders and regular troops. On the player's side, it's the player characters who are the commanders. On the enemy side, we can use any 5e stat block from any of our way too many bestiary books and use those as commanders. That commander might be a gargantuan dragon, a death knight, or one very passionate and overworked goblin. It's up to you and to the story of your campaign. The battle ends when one side's commanders are all either reduced to zero hit points or forced to leave the battlefield. When that happens, the rest of that side's troops are routed, completely unable to coordinate, and at that point, the battle is won. You might have noticed I mentioned we'd be using swarm type stat blocks for the battalions. This is another way we make this mass combat encounter system easier to use. Even if a battle involves 200,000 soldiers, if we can abstract that to just 10 battalions on each side, it will take us a lot less time to move units around, keep track of hit points, etc. However, we are going to have to make a few changes about how D&D handles swarms. 
Here is how a typical swarm stat block looks like in D&D. Every single swarm shares four characteristics, which are designed to convey that the swarm is more than one creature, even if it's just one stat block. This is all very nice, but we're going to get rid of most of that. As I mentioned earlier, we want our players to be doing the things their characters are good at. This is what D&D is about, this is what they signed up for. We want our party's cleric to have the ability to use their spells to heal the wounded soldiers around them. We want our barbarian to feel like their attacks are cleaving through enemy troops. We're still playing D&D, so the game should focus on giving our players that experience, regardless of whether they're fighting 5 goblins in a cave or 5,000 goblins on the battlefield. We're keeping the idea of scaling the damage dealt by a battalion down if they take too much damage, there's nothing wrong with that, it doesn't prevent our players from doing things their characters should be good at, so it gets to stay. But everything else? Everything else has to go. These traits are here for the sake of realism, but you can get your players to suspend their disbelief just the same by simply narrating how a battalion has a bunch of soldiers in it. You don't necessarily need that to be reflected in the rules if doing it means your players will enjoy the game less. Another aspect of D&D that this system needs to account for is the speed of play. In combat, players generally want nothing more than to get back to the part where their character is doing something. So anytime we spend moving battalions around, it's time our players aren't moving their characters around. And that's something we generally want to avoid. So there's two measures I've taken to make mass combat go much, much faster. The first one is that when a battalion attacks another battalion, we don't roll anything. The attack hits and it deals average damage. If the attack had advantage, which is usually caused by a thing a player character did, it deals double the average damage instead. If it had disadvantage, it deals half. We still roll as usual if a commander attacks or is attacked by a battalion. But in the battle between battalions, we don't go into details because that is not necessary. Just doing this halved the time it took to run mass combat at my table. The second measure that increases the speed of play is that battalions don't roll initiatives. Only the commanders on both sides do. As an action, a commander can give an order to a battalion within 120 feet of them. And on initiative count zero, the battalions act according to the last order they've received. By collapsing all of these battalions' actions together, and by removing the part where they have to make decisions, we make it so much faster. Even if there are 20 battalions on the battlefield, you can usually get through all of them in under a minute. There's a bunch of other small details in the supplement, like how I recommend you give your player characters war horses so that they can move about the battlefield more easily. But I think what I've mentioned so far covers the main aspects of how this mass combat system works. Those are the main things you'll have to teach your players. And if you are not a YouTuber who has tricked thousands of people into thinking they were interested in listening to a 4,000 words video essay about game design, you can probably get your players up to speed in about one or two minutes. So now we have a system which is easy to learn and fits D&D's gameplay, but haven't made it feel like tactical mass combat yet. Fundamentally, in a tactical game, there are choices which are better than others and players are rewarded if they can consistently find those good choices and avoid the bad ones. That's the thing that makes a game feel tactical. They are games about reading a situation and adapting your approach to it. The way this is usually done in strategy games is through something nerds call orthogonal unit differentiation, but normal people usually just call it rock, paper, scissors mechanics. In pretty much every single strategy game that lets you move units on a battlefield, there are three core types of units which counter one another. You have infantry, archers, and cavalry. Infantry loses to archers because by the time the infantry catches up to the archers, the constant rain of arrows will have whittled down your front line to nothing. Archers lose to cavalry because a cavalry charge is so quick that the archers can't do any significant damage before the Wall of Bane crashes into their ranks. And cavalry loses to infantry because the heavy shields and armors infantry carry with them can put a very brutal stop to a cavalry charge. This is what most of those games boil down to. They might not always make it super obvious, because those games tend to have 56 different types of infantry battalions, but these are usually just the infantry from different factions or at different levels of technology, and we can replicate that by just adding one trait to our battalion stat blocks. The important part is, each unit has a role, and those three main roles of infantry, archers and cavalry counter each other. In a lot of these games, you don't even need 
to implement those rock, paper, scissors mechanics. They just naturally emerge when you create a game that has slow but tanky infantry, archers with ranged attacks, and a fast cavalry. But since we want our mass combat system to be easy for our D&D players to learn, we're going to make it extra obvious to the point where hopefully our players won't even be able to miss the fact that there is a rock, paper, scissors thing going on. Our infantry battalion deals slashing damage and is resistant to bludgeoning. Our archers deal piercing and are resistant to slashing. And our cavalry deals bludgeoning and is resistant to piercing. In practice, this doesn't actually change much. Regardless of whether or not you give your archers resistance to slashing damage, they probably won't ever be in a position where infantry can attack them in the first place. But by giving the three core battalion types these very obvious strengths and weaknesses, we communicate to our players exactly how they need to use each of these battalions. Even a player who has never played a single strategy game in their life can tell they need to use their infantry to protect their archers from enemy cavalry, and then use their own cavalry to outflank the enemy archers. But the supplement also includes five other types of battalions besides those three core ones. So what's up with that? Where do they fit in the rock-paper-scissors scheme? Well, they don't. And that's because those rock-paper-scissors mechanics are just one application of this larger and much nerdier concept that I mentioned earlier, orthogonal unit differentiation. The basic idea of OUD is that if you want to increase the tactical depth of a game, you have to create a set of units with different roles rather than just create stronger and weaker versions of existing units. Basically, we're adding Lizard and Spock to our little game of rock, paper, scissors. Since tactical games are about making good choices, we make those games more interesting by introducing new choices. So those five extra battalion types each fulfills a different role. Artillery can set the ground on fire to do some positional denial. Then you've got the Divine Battalion, which supports your other troops by giving them buffs and healing the wounded. Or the Druidic Battalion, which can transport your troops between forests. With that, we have a fun, tactical, mass combat game that a D&D player can easily learn, but we still need one last thing, and that's to make it fit in a D&D story. Right now, our players don't really have a reason to care about any of these tactics that we've tried to put in front of them. As long as they win the encounter and their character survives, doesn't really matter to a player whether they won by a landslide or they had a Pyrrhic victory where two-thirds of their army was slaughtered. In strategy games, like Total War or Edge of Empire, if you lose a good chunk of your forces, it's going to make the next battle harder. So the better you do in the short term, the better you'll do in the long term. And as a result, the most effective strategy is to act like a great general and do whatever you can to ensure the survival of your troops. Unless you're playing Skaven, I guess. But what's important is, in those games, it's only because of this second layer of long-term strategy that the players care about the short-term tactics. But we've decided we're not doing a strategy campaign. We're just doing that one mass combat encounter. So we're going to have to come up with a different way for our one mass combat encounter to have long-term consequences. Otherwise, we're actively encouraging our players to act like absolute sociopaths and send their troops to the meat grinder because we've accidentally made that the best, most efficient strategy, which is not usually something we like to see fantasy heroes doing. You see, killbots have a preset kill limit. Knowing their weakness, I sent wave after wave of my own men at them until they reached their limit and shut down. Kiff, show them the medal I won. <sighs> so the supplement has a column about how to set up the story of a mass combat encounter so that its rewards, or the things at stake, scale with how many of the battalions under your player's command survive the battle. Some of them are carrots you can dangle in front of your players. For example, maybe the local ruler promised a reward of 20,000 gold pieces if the player characters can lead their troops to victory. But for each allied battalion, which is reduced to zero hit points, a thousand gold from that reward is instead going to be given to the families of the soldiers who were lost. Then there's also sticks, which you can use to hit your players, right in the emotions. For example, maybe a bunch of NPCs have been conscripted in the army. This includes backstory NPCs like friends and family, but it could also just be that one shopkeeper that you improvised on the spot and that your players fell in love with. Every time a battalion is destroyed, there's a chance that this beloved NPC might be gone forever, and it will be your players' fault when that happens. And that's it for today's video. But what if you did want to run an entire Build a Kingdom campaign? Well, I've added one last page in the document, which gives you the tools to do just that. 
you can find my mass combat simplified supplement for free in the video description. It has everything we've talked about here, and then a couple battle maps that I've made while playtesting it. If you want more videos like this, here's a video about vehicle combat, another type of encounter that probably should get a bit more love. Or you could check that one, which YouTube thinks you should watch. I don't know what it is. It's probably cool though. See you next month for a bit of a special video. Until then, have a good one.